Zach Slayback is a personal acquaintance and, dare I say, even a friend of mine. He's an entrepreneur and a writer who focuses on issues of education, innovation, and philosophy. He's um, a former student at the University of Pennsylvania. Is that right, Zach? That's correct. And uh, since I myself am an alumnus of Princeton University, which uh, has a certain rivalry with, uh, with UPenn, I just owe him that much more gratitude for being willing to talk to me today. Um, <laughs> So Zach speaks and writes on a regular basis about college, the negative effects of elite education, and how we can improve education for individuals and for society at large. So to begin, Zach, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, where you grew up, how you came to go to UPenn, and how you came to be where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, was a student at the University of Pennsylvania for two years. It was my top choice school when I was in high school. Uh, I got in, you know, early decision. And I noticed a weird thing happening uh, with my classmates and even to a certain extent with myself. These people who I'd met in high school or maybe new student orientation uh, who came to a, a phenomenal school for the opportunity to pursue things that they themselves had wanted to pursue for a good portion of their lives, things that they were passionate about. Let's say they want to start a business or even uh, become a scientist or uh, even go into the arts. I found that by the end of the sophomore year, and as I followed them more closely uh, during what would have been my junior year, uh, this continued to be the case, they started to drift away from those things. And they were attracted to more things like uh, consulting, uh, banking, um, Teach for America, graduate school. These people who had these big dreams and aspirations were honestly, I, I couldn't really find a good word for it until uh, recently uh, when I read Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, uh, where he said that uh, elite higher education is the place uh, where people who had big dreams in high school go to get caught in uh, rivalries over traditional careers like consulting and management. Um, and in short, they become conformists. That was, that really struck a chord with me. So I ended up taking a, a leave of absence originally my, after my sophomore year because I was really disenchanted and I felt like I wasn't building anything. So I ended up going to a uh, friend of mine um, at the time who was launching Praxis and I, I just told him, let me work for you. Uh, you don't even need to pay me. Um, just let me come work for you for a little bit. I just want to build something. And uh, I found after the end of my sophomore year that I was really enjoying it. And uh, I decided to take a year off to pursue it and figured by the end of that year, there was no reason for me to go back. So what exactly does Praxis do overall? Yeah, what do you that's a great do? question. So uh, Praxis is uh, the company that I, uh, like I said, I'm on the founding team of and that I work with right now. And what we do is we take uh, young people ages 18 to 25 or so, and we place them at growing businesses, startups, SMBs all around the country, uh, where they get a high quality work experience for 10 months. During that 10 months, they're going to be working around the founder and they might be working day to day with the founder of that business. They get to see what it's like to actually build, launch, and operate a business. And then in addition to that, they do a one year um, education component that is pretty much a professional and personal development program. What goes into that is they get their own Praxis mentor, somebody who gets to work with them on their one month, six month, uh, one year, three year, five year goals, and uh, try to build to achieve those goals. We hear a lot in the news about whether college is worth it, whether it's for everyone. We hear a lot in the current presidential campaign about, you know, making higher education more affordable. There are a lot of uh, controversies about student loan debt and so on. So with all of that in mind, what is your overall view of higher education? Do you think that it's a waste of time for everyone? Or is it worth it for some people and not for others? Is it something that we should generally discourage young people from entering into? Or how would you sum up your view on the whole situation? Yeah, I don't like to collectivize, so it's really, really hard for me to speak for everybody. Um, I can make a couple broad generalizations uh, and observations about uh, schooling in general. Um, but there, there are a couple of points uh, in there. There's, there's a lot of points in there. Uh, but to start out, I would say that higher education is one of these things that in popular discussions and especially in politics, people view from a human capital perspective, meaning you go and you become a better person, a more hireable candidate, whatever. You increase your human capital. 
that's simply not true. In very few cases does somebody go and increase their human capital. I, I think that removing somebody from the workforce for four years uh, and then throwing a lot of debt on them is a really bad way of increasing their human capital. Uh, a better way, if we go back to opportunity costs, a better way would be to actually put them in a workplace. I think if you took most people who want to be lawyers and you put them in uh, a law office for four years, one, I think most of them would decide they don't want to be lawyers. Um, <laughs> At that rate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two, I think that they would still learn a lot more than if they were, say, like poli-sci uh, undergrads at, in college. Uh, they learn more about what it means to be a lawyer. They learn more um, in the human capital vein of things, right? The things that actually help them get jobs. What education really is at the end of the day, what schooling really is at the end of the day, is signaling, right? Um, you get a degree to uh, signal to employers that you're a minimally viable candidate. And I think that the emphasis there needs to be minimally viable. Do you think that you can convince large numbers of employers to be mm -hmm. willing to look beyond academic credentials? Because I feel like a lot of employers really do insist that you at least have, you know, a bachelor's degree from a four-year college, if not something more, in order to, you know, pay you the big bucks. And um, I feel like if we're going to get a lot of young people to you know, stop thinking that they have to go to college in order to make it, we also need to get employers to be willing to recognize and hire yep. people who yep. haven't necessarily gone to college. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, uh, that's actually a lot easier than convincing young people uh, to forego the four years. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's actually a lot. It, it, it's the easier side of the, uh, of the uh, calculation. You, you would think it'd be the harder side, but it's actually the easier. And I'll tell you um, why that is. There's a couple of reasons. Um, one is, like I said, it's really hard to find good talent. And a lot of these employers are seeing the candidates who are coming to them with college degrees, and they're not, they're not Im that impressive. So they're willing to try something new if they can find good talent, right? If you can tell them, I can get you somebody who is as good, if not better, than somebody who's coming out with a college degree and will be better by the end of 10 months with you, it's actually really easy to get a lot of them to agree to try it. Um, the other thing is you'd actually be surprised at how many uh, employers nowadays actually require a bachelor's degree. On a lot of job posting, so what I do in some of my um, free research time uh, for my job is I just pursue job postings to get an idea of what companies are looking for. What a lot of them do is they either don't include a BA at all, or they will say something like BA or equivalent work experience. And that seems to be something that's pretty recent. Uh, and that's really interesting to me. Uh, what they consider equivalent work experience obviously uh, depends on the employer. But the ones I've talked to, um, I'll give an example. Uh, we have a Praxis participant working at a, an Inc. 500 uh, advertising agency in Phoenix. Uh, and this, this particular participant does not have a college degree. And when I pitched uh, the company on taking a participant, uh, they said, you know, we really don't care so long as this person is hardworking and they meet a minimum standard. A equivalent work experience to us is maybe a year of working in our industry. Four years of like uh, an advertising degree from Arizona State is equivalent to one year of actually working somewhere. Uh, and I would say that's that's probably about the norm that I have found. So just for my viewers' benefits, um, I met Zach a few years ago when I was doing a summer internship uh, through an organization called the Institute for Humane Studies. And I was interning at uh, the Institute for Justice, which is the sort of premier public, libertarian public interest law firm in the United States. I uh, sort of met Zach, through that general network, uh, I don't know if you still um, think of yourself as a libertarian, Zach. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, if, if that's a question, if I do, then yes, I, I do. Fantastic. So do I. I thought it would be cool if we could just end on that note with you um, discussing how, you know, your libertarian views have sort of interacted with and influenced your views on schooling and de-schooling and the work that you do now. Yeah, I would say that my, um, my, my, my views on the individual's role in their own life um, are a combination of kind of like these libertarian views on spontaneous orders um, and the importance of allowing individuals to plan for themselves. And uh, Peter Thiel, if, if, you're, if you haven't read it, I certainly encourage you to read Zero to One, uh, Peter Thiel's book that he released last year. T 
Teal talks about kind of on the other end of the spectrum, definite optimism, having a, a place you want to go and having a clear plan to get there. Structure should not be imposed on individuals. Those individuals should be allowed to discover that structure for themselves. But once they discover that structure, and once they discover what they want and what they're good at and what they want their lives to look like, they need to have a very clear plan to get there. So I'm not somebody who just is like, oh, you know, just go do whatever you want. No, you need to have a plan to get there. And that's how I kind of view Praxis, how Praxis plays into all this too, right? If you know you want to be a, you want to found your own company someday, then you, and, and you, you see your end vision, right? You, you're definite and you're optimistic. How do you get there? And telling you that you have to go get a degree in like sociology uh, or business administration or something like that before you can actually go join the workforce, I think is absurd. Um, similarly, again, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, um, you, you do have to go do that, right? So I think that people need to plan for themselves. They need to be responsible individuals. And when they fail to plan or they fail to plan uh, accurately, they need to bear that responsibility themselves. When people talk about uh, student debt forgiveness, I, I always have to just roll my eyes because while there are certain situations that come up that I think that are unforeseen, um, that's not what people are talking about when they talk about student for debt forgiveness, right? They're talking about like blanket student debt forgiveness of just forgiving everybody's student debt. And I'm sorry that you went and got a degree in uh, women's studies of the uh, you know, of underwater basket weaving in 13th century Brazil. You know you're going to raise some, you're gonna raise some dander with that, right? What? <laughs> you know you're going to raise some uh, hackles with these references to women's studies basket weaving, huh? I mean, it's just not an employable, if, if there is any, if there is anything to the human capital theory of education, I think that it would sit in a degree that has, at least sounds employable. It's just sheer irresponsibility to uh, rack up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt and want it discharged upon everybody else because you either weren't able to get the scholarships, uh, financial aid, or study something that has a higher ROI. Um, when people talk about, oh, you have to go to get a call, go to college to get a job, I kind of just laugh because I know that that's not true, uh, and I know that the the direction in which the economy is heading is making it less and less true. Okay, it's a lot of great food for thought there. Yeah. Anyway, folks, um, that's all for now, but I really wanna thank you, Zach, again, for taking time out of your very busy yeah. schedule. Thank uh, you, Kim. Work with me, and um, stay tuned, folks. Zach, you're the man. I'll talk Thanks to you. Thanks so much. Peace out. See ya.